How are you? I'm Mike Sheridan and this is The Dell. David Rudolph is a civil rights attorney who appeared in the popular Netflix series The Staircase where he won plaudits and fans alike for his defence of Michael Peterson. David is currently on a speaking tour with yours truly and has sold out nights around Ireland and the rest of Europe, giving his take on the much debated case. David Rudolph. How are you? Uh, it's great to chat to you. Enjoy it. We had a, we've, so we've, for people who don't know, we're on tour at the moment, well you're on tour, um, and you're doing eight shows in Ireland, you're going all the way around the country, and we had, I'm emceeing for you, and we had the first show last night. We did. In Cork, we're in Liberty Hall now, uh, ahead of the second show, um, but that first show last night was, 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 was incredibly intense, and it's your first experience of Ireland, and it was adoration all the way through the crowd. It, it was magic, really. Uh, it was a great crowd. Uh, they had amazing questions uh, and just an amazing atmosphere for me. Um, is that something that you're used to now at this point? Because, you, I mean, you were the real, like, I mean, not that there can be a standout star in a, in a show like this, but there can be somebody, as we saw, making a murder with Jerry Bunning, who I know is a, a friend of yours as well. There are people that, uh, audiences just respond to, and you, you, you're the person that audiences have responded to um, with the staircase. So were you used uh, to this kind of, since the show premiered in June, I guess? Yeah, I mean, I've, got, I've, gotten, I've gotten some nice receptions, but I have to say that uh, the, the, uh, the feel in the room last night was special for me, and, and I, I attribute it to uh, sort of the Irish spirit. Yeah. Uh, it, was, it was great. Great stuff. Okay, so let's let's talk about the let's talk about the staircase. Let's talk about Michael. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the case. Sure. Um, you uh, you because one of the questions you got asked a lot. I noticed from last night is oh you know how did you and Michael meet? How did you and Michael start? Uh, or how did you become to represent uh, Michael Jordan's mm -hmm. case? And then all of a sudden there's a documentary crew <laughs> involved in this. Yes, indeed. Um, so you came on board with Michael a couple of months before the documentary crew. I did. Right? Yeah. Uh, Michael Michael hadn't yet been charged. Uh, his brother had reached out uh, to various lawyers he knew. His brother is a lawyer. Uh, his brother Bill, who appears in the Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Bill had gotten my name from several people. Uh, so Bill called me uh, and asked me if I'd be interested in coming and talking with Michael. Uh, I was. It was an interesting case. Uh, uh, and so my investigator, Ron Jurette, and I uh, went to Michael's house uh, the first time. Uh, just to talk with him, to get a feel for him, to see, because, you know, it's an intense relationship when you're representing somebody, and sometimes there's just no chemistry there. Sometimes you just don't feel like you can really uh, uh, connect with the person. Uh, but with Michael, I connected virtually immediately. Um, Ron felt good about it. Uh, we spent some time in the house talking about what happened the night that uh, Kathleen died, uh, and we just sort of went from there. And what was your initial response to the case, to, I'm assuming, pictures of the crime scene, footage of the crime scene? Well, uh, you know, the, the, the scene, we, we don't refer to it as a crime scene. We, we refer to it as a scene. Of course. Uh, but uh, uh, my initial reaction was that it was going to be a big problem in the case, uh, that it, it didn't, quote, look like an accident. It, it looked was unusual like a, circumstances. Yeah, and it, and it was a horrific-looking scene. I mean, there was blood all over. Uh, and your initial impression was that something really bad happened there. I mean, that, that's just your gut impression. So I knew if I was going to be involved in this case, I was going to have to do something to overcome that. Uh, and among the things I did early on was to contact the people who I thought were the best experts in the United States about the various uh, items that we were going to have to deal with. Okay. Um, and Ron did an incredible job in this. I know Ron is has, has re recently passed away. He has, um, and, and uh, Ron was my friend and my investigator for uh, 25 years. Uh, a former policeman. He a former policeman who uh, went in, into a private investigation. I met him in uh, 1994 in another case, and we tried four or five major, major murder cases together, he and I. So he was somebody who I was in a foxhole with multiple times and he was a great person to be in a foxhole with because he always had your back. Uh, you're obviously dealing with, you know, um, horrible, cr horrible crimes or horrible circumstances here um, in a lot of cases. How important is it to have that kind of relationship with somebody who you know has your back, who you know there can be moments of levity with that you can kind of, 
make each other laugh and then this to do so. And we see, we see it in the, in the series, we see yeah. it in the staircase. Yeah. Well, uh, there's two things that are important. Number one is that you need an investigator who is gonna turn over every stone, who is gonna be ceaseless in his work ethic. Uh, and that was Ron uh, always. Uh, but you don't always have the personal relationship. You know, sometimes the person's a great investigator uh, but you just don't quite click uh, on a personal level. Ron and I had it both. We had, Ron was an amazing investigator, and we had that personal relationship, which, which really helps you. You know, we lived in an apartment together for five months during the trial. It's intense circumstances. Uh, right, intense. we had yeah. 32 banker's boxes of, of evidence that we had gathered and cataloged uh, that we had to go through and dig through and figure out what we're gonna do the next day. Uh, and so having Ron there, you know, when things are going terrible, you know, when, when all of a sudden, uh, you know, they're exhuming a body uh, <laughs> and you're having to see that uh, on TV, it's really nice to have somebody there who, who can sort of keep you level. Okay. And what, what was your first, I suppose, impression of, of Michael when, when, you, when you initially spoke to him? I know you said, okay, some people you, you kind of click with, some clients you'll click with, some clients you won't. And um, because, I mean, we'll get into this, I suppose, the semantics of the case a little bit more uh, in a few minutes, but he's, he's, he seems like quite an eccentric guy. And with an ex he lived, lived a somewhat eccentric existence. Yeah, well, his, his existence was, was not all that eccentric, but, but he, he's, he's a sort of, uh, I guess eccentric's the, the best way of putting it. He's, he's not your typical, he's certainly not your typical Southerner. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and he's not really a typical uh, person uh, but I liked him. Uh, he, had a, he had a very sarcastic sense of humor, uh, a sort of ironic personality. You can see that at various times in, in, the, in the film. Uh, and that's how I am. Uh, and so he and I got along just fine. Uh, you know, I could, I could joke with him about things that perhaps I couldn't have joked with other people about. Uh, and sometimes you just need that in order to break the, the tension. Uh, and I never found Michael to be anything less than completely honest and open with me. Uh, and that is really important because for a lawyer, a defense lawyer to do his job, the client has got to let him know the truth no matter what. Uh, I would say one of the reoccurring um, emotions we, we kind of see from you throughout the trial is frustration. Um, we obviously with the blow poke been found um, and you know, I know you thought, oh, well, well, this is it. This, any other case, this would be, you know, close and shut the bisexuality thing coming out. Um, how, just how frustrating was that during the trial? Because it, it, it can't be easy to keep your emotions on a level when, when, you, when you feel you really know what's right. The, the most frustrating thing is it's something that's shown in the, in the film, and that is when I was trying to get a ruling from the court about whether that evidence was going to be permitted or not. Because we had filed motions to keep that evidence out, and it should have been kept out, as the judge finally admitted 15 years later. Uh, but uh, the really frustrating, you know, and all I wanted to know is do I have to deal with it or do I not have to deal with it? It was incredibly frustrating for the judge to simply refuse to rule on that because that left me between a rock and a, and a hard place. If I, if I dealt with it in my opening statement in jury selection, in a sense, I was opening the door uh, to, to all that evidence and certainly opening the door to the jury hearing about it. If I didn't deal with it, then I was opening myself up to being accused later on, not necessarily by the prosecution, but by the jurors in the room to feeling like I wasn't honest with them in my opening statement and in my jury selection because I had not dealt with that. So it really put me in a very difficult place, and, and that was probably the most frustrating thing for me. Once that evidence was coming in, I knew it was coming in, it's not really frustration at that point, it's how am I gonna deal with this? You know, how am I gonna- The practicalities. Exactly, of, yeah. and that's really what I focus on, not so much yeah. the frustration about it. And we were frustrated watching it, though. That was the, <laughs> that was the thing, yeah. it's like, how, how does this, this doesn't make any sense at all. Yeah. And the media coverage is something too that, that we kind of see uh, splutterings of throughout, throughout the series. Um, and in particular, Nancy Grace, who's, you know, hyperbolic, I think, is a, is a word. That, that would we, be an understatement. That would be an understatement. So 
Uh, how, how did the media coverage um, trail? Because we see, again, we see snippets of it, but this is a four month trial. It's a five month trial. Five month trial. trial and it's a, it was nationwide coverage. It was on Court TV, which, is a, which was a station in the United States uh, uh, that covered trials gavel to gavel. I guess the first trial they did was the OJ case. Uh, they did a number of trials after that. Um, and it was sort of a, it was a circus-like atmosphere in a lot of ways because I don't know if you, I think there are some scenes in the documentary where you can see they had tents set up outside the courthouse. Uh, you know, they had uh, on-air personalities who were outside, you know, waiting for you to, to, to come out and, and be interviewed uh, if you would do that. Uh, there were all kinds of, of uh, uh, journalists who were attending uh, the trial. Uh, so it was pretty much a, a media show, uh, and the problem became that uh, oftentimes what got broadcast had very little relation to what had actually happened in court. Uh, the court TV caught it all, uh, but you know most people are not sitting there. They're watching uh, highlights, uh, yeah. right? They're not sitting there for six hours. Although there were some, uh, but but not very many people are sitting there watching for six hours straight. And so they watch the highlights. And so when Nancy Grace gets on in her vitriolic uh, you know, way uh, and starts you know, sneering at some of the evidence, and then a court TV reporter uh, gets it wrong in terms of what actually happened in court, that was really frustrating. Yeah. Did you ever see that movie Gone Girl with Ben Affleck? I didn't, know. There's a, the David Fincher movie. It's a great movie. It's an adaptation of a book. But there's a very, there's a, there's a very I wouldn't say subtle take on Nancy Grace in that, but it's, a, it's an interesting take on Nancy Grace. I'd be interested to see what you think of that. Um, okay, so the whole core TV thing, that started happening really, you're saying since OJ. Is this, it's yeah, the, around, the, the, around the mid 90s. So did the media coverage then, you know, in your experience, you've been doing civil rights attorney for a long, long time. Did it start just getting a bit more intense around that period? Because the trial was 2001? The trial was 2003. 2003, the, the, sorry. Uh, her death was in 2000. December of 2001. Um, you know, I think the OJ trial was sort of a watershed moment. Um, you know, virtually everyone in the United States was sort of at least tangentially aware of it. A lot of people watched it. Even more people watched highlights. I mean, I can remember being in a gym, uh, you know, working out on a, on a stair stepper, uh, and I'm, I'm watching Chris Darden, the prosecutor, hand the glove to OJ and ask him to put it on. And I'm, I'm watching OJ sort of struggling and he can't put the glove on. And I'm thinking to myself, that's the stupidest thing I've ever seen a prosecutor do. I mean, you don't, you don't perform an experiment in court in front of the jury when you don't know what the result's gonna be. And of course, that was the famous, that led to the famous line, if the glove don't fit, you must acquit, uh, because it didn't fit. Uh, so, it was, it was pretty much 24-7, uh, and I think it sort of introduced people to the idea that um, uh, courtroom drama in real life could be more interesting uh, than what's depicted in the movies and on TV. Because it's got real life consequences as well. You know that better than anybody, of course. Indeed. Okay, let, let's talk about the, the trial uh, a little bit. Um, um, I kind of mentioned there briefly earlier on, but when the blow poke was found, you, re you really found, you really, you, first of all, you realised this is obviously a huge moment in the case. This has been a massive part of the prosecution's case, saying the blow poke, she, you know, Kathleen had been bludgeoned with the, with the blow poke. What was your initial reaction when you, when you found that the, or heard that the blow poke had been found? Uh, I was worried <laughs> uh, because I had spent the previous four months uh, explaining to the jury that this was really an accident. Um, and, you know, the blow poke gets found uh, in a corner of a, a dark corner of a, a garage that's never used. Uh, and uh, at that point, my basic thought is there better not be any blood on there. <laughs> you know, uh, it could have been a really bad moment for the defense, uh, depending on what was on the blow poke. Um, uh, but as it turned out, of course, we were able to test it. There was no blood on it. And at that moment, I felt like this trial is won. Uh, I couldn't imagine. Under normal circumstances, uh, you know, for one for a better phrase, would it have been, do you think? You would think so. Yeah. I mean, here's the prosecutor for four months talking about the mysteriously missing murder weapon. Uh, 
uh, the blow poke, and now we find it, and it's not missing, and it's not the murder weapon. Uh, so you would think that that would sort of wrap it up for the jury. But instead, in closing argument, uh, the prosecutors got up and disingenuously said, well, we never said it was the blowpoke. We said it was something like the blowpoke. So that sort of changed the, the whole theory for them. And again, you'd think that a jury would say, wait a minute, guys. <laughs> you were saying it was a blowpoke. Don't, don't be blowing smoke at us now. Uh, you know, you didn't prove your case, but that's not what happened. Uh, another element of it as well that, that, that I suppose comes out uh, during the trial is, is Michael's bisexuality. Uh, and we were talking about this last night on stage and it was interesting, one of the questions that came up was, do you think that this would have been an issue if this case had, a, had have happened today? You know, not in, 2000 and, not in 2003. And it, it's fair to say it wouldn't have been, but I think what the director said was quite interesting. The director was interviewed uh, Juan Javier, I believe his name is, French oh, director. Oh, yeah. Juan, Juan Lestrade. Juan Lestrade, yeah. sorry. Um, my French is terrible. Um, but one of, the, one of the things he said was interesting, he said the, he believed that the prosecutor, he didn't know whether Michael was guilty or innocent, but he believed that the prosecution tried to paint a picture of somebody who could be guilty. Is, is that something that you would agree with? Yeah, well, in a sense. Because there's no evidence, really. Yeah, in a sense, I think, I think uh, what, what the prosecution was really doing was trying to distract the jury from the lack of evidence to a character assassination of Michael uh, so that instead of the jury focusing on what was the motive or, or what's the evidence, instead they're focusing on what kind of a person Michael is. Uh, and that is not what a trial is supposed to be about. Uh, so I, I really think that that was to prejudice Michael in the eyes of the jury. It had no other purpose. Uh, and, and I think it was probably very effective. Um, and again, like looking at the, the, the case as a whole now, kind of, and I want to get into the L theory a little bit too, but you know, it was 14 years of your life really, up until the retrial. Um, how do you look back at this case now? Look, people, assuming people have seen the final episode, assuming people have Googled and know everything that, that happened and everything that went on, how do you feel about it now? Um, relieved. <laughs> <laughs> that it's over. Relieved that it's over and relieved that it came out well at the end of the, of the day and relieved that this documentary uh, has received as much positive response as it has and relieved that people are talking about the issues in the case. You know, it's not just did Michael do it, did Michael not do it? There's a lot of that, obviously. Because well, this is a huge thing for you. This is what you do for a living. Your practice is wrongfully, uh, wrongfully convicted. Um, yeah, and, th and that really has come about in the last 10 years. After this, you know, before this trial, I had done exclusively criminal defense work. Since this trial, I've really shifted my practice to representing people who have been wrongfully convicted. Um, and, and that, I think, is a direct result uh, of what happened in this case. Um, but you know, for me, the fact that now this documentary is out there uh, and people are seeing it, it, it's really what I've been, what I've cared about for the last 40 years of my life. Uh, it's what I've spent my life doing. Uh, it's what I've spent my life fighting against. Uh, and, and it's very gratifying to see people be able to appreciate it with their own eyes. Is that one of the reasons why you've, you've kind of taken the show on the road, as it were, to get that message across? Because you, you had said defense lawyers were I'd never really given a, a great rap on TV or, or in movies before. Yeah, well, it, A, it was a big part of my motivation in agreeing to do this at all, do the, the documentary, uh, was to be able to, to show people uh, how criminal defense lawyers work what we do, not just me, but all criminal defense lawyers, and not just in the United States, uh, but all over the world. I mean, you know, uh, uh, there's an organization in the United States called the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, uh, and the motto is, liberty's last champions. Uh, and that's exactly what we are. And, and that's true in the United States, it's true of criminal defense lawyers here in Ireland, it's true of criminal defense lawyers in China or Iran or wherever else we exist. We are, we are the, the last sort of line of defense, if you will, between the individual and the power of the state. Uh, and that's an awesome power that we're pushing back against. Uh, so, you know, for me, uh, being able to have that represented on screen 
is just a tremendously rewarding thing. Uh, and a lot of theories, and there's been a lot of talk since the, since the series came out, which, which I mean is, shows how passionate people are uh, about the series, about you, about your work, about Michael, either way, whatever way they think of him. Um, I want to talk about the L theory a little bit, because that's not something that came out afterwards. That's something that actually happened during the trial, and that's been debated massively. Uh, since then, but that was brought to you, or initially you were saying it was brought to the prosecution by one of Michael's neighbours. It was, uh, not until the very end of the trial. Uh, you were preparing your closing arguments. I was preparing my closing arguments, and, and Larry Pollard, who is one of Michael's neighbours and a friend, uh, came to my office, uh, and he said, uh, I think I know what happened here. And he said, you know, I, I've just been to Jim Harden's office, that's the prosecutor, and he didn't want to hear anything I had to say. Uh, which I didn't think was terribly surprising, <laughs> frankly. Uh, and Larry proceeded to tell me that there's this, these barred owls that live, B-A-R-R-E-D, not B-A-R-D, uh, barred owls who live uh, in the neighborhood in the trees, and they have these huge talons. Uh, and he, he believed that the marks on the back of Kathleen's head had been caused by one of these owls. Uh, and of course, there I am, I've, I've tried this case for five months now. Uh, I've been telling the jury, uh, as I believed, that it was a fall. Uh, there is no evidence about owls in the neighborhood in the trial. And even if I wanted to get up uh, and tell the jury that, I couldn't because under the rules, you can't talk in closing argument about something that isn't in evidence. So I basically, I didn't throw Larry out of my office, but I basically said, Larry, I, you know, I'm trying to get my closing argument together, and that's an interesting theory, uh, but I really can't do anything with it. Uh, and that's the first time I ever heard anything about the owl theory. And at what point then did you start to realize this could be a conceivable uh, part N of Kathleen's death? Not, not for years afterward, to be honest. Uh, you know, it sort of became a joke. Uh, in, in North Carolina. Because it sounds kind of outlandish. Oh, it does. Yeah. Of, of course it yeah. does. You know, if, if you just present it, and, yeah. and, and, you know, Larry didn't make it clear, so there were people who thought, oh, it, you know, he's saying there was an owl in the house, uh, and that would be sort of absurd. Uh, and, and so the whole thing just became a joke. Um, and so I really didn't think much about it. Uh, and then in 2011, we were able to get Michael a new trial. Uh, based on Dwayne Deaver's perjury. Uh, and at that point, I needed to start taking it more seriously. And also at that point, several developments had, had taken place. You know, number one, Larry had gotten uh, experts, uh, people who were experts in owls, to file affidavits uh, talking about barred owl behavior uh, and the fact that um, uh, barred owls had been known to attack human beings particularly, interestingly enough, uh, in, in the winter months, like in December. Uh, so that began to, to take shape. Uh, and then, you know, by 2011, there was a thing called YouTube, which didn't really exist except for maybe, you know, people putting their uh, animals or, or babies on uh, in 2003. Uh, and all of a sudden, there were all these videos surfacing of barred owls attacking the heads of people, which, you know, we had never seen before. Um, not because they didn't exist, but there wasn't a, <coughs> a platform to show them. Uh, and so that is what really caused me to begin to look more seriously at the owl theory. It was, in, in your experience, and obviously we, we see elements of it in, uh, in the series, when Michael spends eight years in jail and uh, what it does to him physically. Um, you know you were shocked when you hadn't seen Michael in a few years. You, you, you'd, you'd kind of, um, you'd spoken to him over the phone and I, th I think it's, you'd written to each other or whatever, but you exactly. hadn't seen him in a long time and you were blown away by how much he'd aged and how much jail had affected him. It might sound like a rudimentary question, but how, do, how does jail change people? Especially the, the people who know they're innocent. Well, I was gonna say, I think for someone who is innocent, uh, jail or prison, uh, more accurately, is just a horrendous experience. I mean, imagine being locked up. You're told what to do every minute of the day. You're told what time to get up. Uh, you're told what to eat. 
you're told when to shower, you're told when you can go to the bathroom, you're told when you can exercise, you're told when you can watch TV, you're told what you can read. Uh, every element of your life is controlled generally by people who are not the most uh, sensitive human beings in the world. Uh, and, and here you are, these folks are controlling your every movement, and you've done nothing wrong. And, and I, can't, I can hardly imagine a worse situation to be in uh, for a day or a week, let alone for eight years. And, and the impact it had on Michael was, was, as you see in the documentary, really staggering. It's heartbreaking for his son as well. It was, it was staggering. He tries to get really up, was. he can barely walk. And, yeah. um, I, I, look, I suppose that's sort of Michael and other people that you've uh, represented over the years or that you're currently representing, wherever it may be. What's the overwhelming, when, when, they, when they do get out, you know, when, they, when be it DNA, be it something comes out and clears their names, what's the overwhelming feeling from them? You know, you'd think it would be anger, but it's not. Um, I think the overwhelming feeling is relief and gratitude for being out. Uh, and, um, you know, of all the people who I've represented, I can think of only one who had any real anger about what had happened. Uh, and, and that's despite the fact that in every single case I've been involved in, it's been police misconduct that caused the wrongful conviction. You know, it, it's one thing if an eyewitness just gets it wrong, you know, not on purpose, but they just misidentify somebody. That's bad enough. Uh, but it's hard to blame that person. Uh, and I've, I've seen situations where the person, in some ways, the person who identified the person wrongfully is hurt as much as the person, psychologically, as the person who did the time because they feel so guilty about it. Yeah. Uh, but when it's police misconduct that causes it, um, that's almost beyond the pale. And that's a, that's a massive issue in America at the moment. I mean, we would have seen uh, reverberations of it in Ireland and, and this side of the world with the Colin Kaepernick um, uh, taking knee um, and, the, and the kind of uproar that that, that seems to have caused. Uh, do, you, do you have a take on this? Do you, because obviously you've, you've got an aid experience uh, with both sides. Yeah, well, um, I do have a take on it, and that is that um, uh, I think that uh, people develop sort of tunnel vision uh, about their beliefs. So, uh, you know, if, if you think that, uh, that Colin Kaepernick is, is just a bad person or uh, disloyal, and then taking the knee becomes an act of disloyalty. Uh, and if you, if you consider him to be an honorable person who's simply expressing a view uh, that he comes by honestly and as a result of his own experiences in life as well as the history of black folks in America, then you don't view him as being a disloyal American. You view that as being what people fight for uh, to be able to express. And so I think, you know, unfortunately now uh, in the United States, people are, are coming at these sorts of issues um, from their own little silos uh, and and it's really hard to talk with people on the other side. People are not, people are not communicating. Uh, they're, they're sort of yelling. Is it, is it the most polarized you felt America be in, in your lifetime? It is amazing. I, I grew up during Vietnam and Watergate, and, and things were pretty polarized back then. You know, you had the, quote, silent majority who Nixon was touting. And then you had all of us who were, you know, the youth back then, uh, who were protesting. And, and that was pretty divisive. Uh, but um, at the end of the day, I think parents and other people started realizing that, uh, you know, what their children were or kids were, or young adults were saying had some real merit. And the country eventually sort of came together, especially when the truth came out about Watergate. And, and you didn't have these politicians fanning the flames. You know, you had, you had politicians who sort of came together and said, wait a minute, uh, this, is, this is beyond what ought to happen, and, and we're going we're gonna to impeach him. Uh, and he would have been convicted at, at a Senate trial. 
And that, in a strange sort of way, healed things. Um, and now, you know, you have this polarized atmosphere in, in Washington where, you know, people excuse things. They excuse the, the shattering of norms uh, in, in, in ways that are sort of inexplicable to me. Uh, and, and I think so for me, this is the worst it's ever been. I mean, you've kind of answered the question already there, I suppose, but what do you think about the comparisons between Donald Trump and Richard Nixon? Because Richard Nixon ultimately did the honorable thing and left, but it was before he was convicted, uh, really. Uh, what I'll say is that um, I wouldn't have thought it possible for anyone to uh, convince me that Richard Nixon was actually a pretty good guy. <laughs> but compared to Mr. Trump, uh, that's what I think. Okay, well, uh, David Rudolph, um, Thanks so much for coming on the Delph. Um, it, it's been an absolute pleasure. We've got plenty more shows to go, and uh, it's an honor hosting them with you. Thank you, Mike. Thanks so much. Thank you.